I think it's safe to say that the 1940s was the toughest decade of Walt Disney's career. Not only did it start off with two of his big movies becoming financial flops, but it was then followed by some major events that forever changed both the company and Walt in a way that left them worse than before. There was the 1941 strike that soured Disney's relationship with his team of artists and animators, and World War II led the government to temporarily take over the studio and had them only make content related to the military. These moments cost Disney about half of his crew, most of his spirit for animation, and especially, a lot of money. So much so that after the war, all they could do was just make little cartoons for either their popular characters or their package films while looking into other ventures to get revenue like making live action features and nature documentaries. It was at that point that Walt realized that if he wanted to take his position back as the leader of the animation industry, he'd have to make another Snow White. And I don't mean just make another animated feature based on a fairy tale starring a princess, but rather that he'd have to risk everything on this one movie to get back on top. And that film was Cinderella. It's the story of an orphan girl named Cinderella, whom despite her kind-hearted nature, is treated terribly by her stepmother Lady Tremaine and her two stepsisters. When they ruin her chance to go to the ball in the royal palace meant to find the prince a girl to marry, her fairy godmother appears to make her dream come true by using magic to make her stand out among the crowd and later fall in love with the prince. But only until midnight when the spell breaks. When it came to the classic fairy tale by Charles Perrault, Walt always had a personal connection to the story. I mean, as a timeless rags to riches tale, I'm sure that's something he could relate to. But this movie was far from the first time he wanted to adapt the story into animation. In fact, one of his laugh grand cartoons back in 1922 was a modern retelling of Cinderella. Afterwards, through the 1930s and early 1940s, Walt and his team made numerous of attempts to make a bigger and better Cinderella cartoon. The idea started out as a silly symphony short, but as early as 1938, they ultimately decided that a feature-length film would be more suitable to tell the tale. Over the years, several storymen tried and failed to make a Cinderella story that Walt would approve of, and production had to be put to a halt by 1945. The concept of a Cinderella movie still loomed over the studio as they tried to keep themselves afloat by producing package films. But it wasn't until in 1947 after the release of Fun and Fancy Free when Walt decided that something must be done to get rid of the company's debt faster and took a gamble on resuming the production of animated features. There were a few that were in development, but Disney had the most confident on Cinderella as his strongest contender to be his next Snow White and greenlit that project first. Now that things were getting serious on making the movie, it was time to bring on board the right people for the job and to seriously input story elements that have been discussed about the years prior, including a cat and mouse subplot where a group of mice ate Cinderella while also avoiding getting caught by the stepmother's cat. However, while Disney returned to producing animated movies, Walt, however, did not entirely. Due to his trauma from the 1941 strike, he became more distant from his own animation productions. In fact, his focus and passion shifted to producing fully live-action features, which his first that he was making at the time was Treasure Island, his hobby of miniature trains, and creating his own theme park. While the sequence directors, Clyde Geronimi, Ham Lusk, and Wilford Jackson were still able to contact Walt from time to time for notes, they were often left on their own devices to determine if some details were good enough for the final film. As for the animation itself, Walt enlisted nine of his most trusted and most skilled animators to become the supervising animators of the department that would continue Disney's animation legacy for many years to come. While ironically in their 30s at the time, Disney named this group after what U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt called the Justices of the Supreme Court, the Nine Old Men. Among them include Eric Larson, Frank Thomas, John Lounsbury, Les Clark, Mark Davis, Milt Call, Ollie Johnston, Ward Kimball, and Wolfgang Reitherman. 
When animating the movie, in an effort to save money, live-action references became more important to the production. While the use of these references was common when making the past Disney movies, this time, the animators had to become more dependent on them to follow the timing and the actors' movements on what was filmed. So much so that they had to do some rotoscoping by tracing the references frame by frame. Unsurprisingly, the animators hated this process, as they felt like it was too restrictive and they were unable to have their say on how the characters can act. The only times when the references were not needed were for animating the animals like Jacques, Gus, and Lucifer, which was why there might have been a bit of jealousy towards the guys who got those characters like Lounsbury, Kimball, and Ritherman, along with Disney veteran Norm Ferguson. But among all the animations produced at the studio, Walt himself stated that his personal favorite piece was the dress transformation scene when the fairy godmother turned Cinderella's torn up dress into a beautiful gown. <laughs> When it came to creating the music, Disney tried to get their own team to make songs for the feature and even considered recycling a deleted song from Snow White. But none of them ultimately got into the film because they didn't fit the criteria of Walt's new plan. What he wanted is for the songs to become hits of their own. He knew that his movies are capable of bringing out songs that would become popular like with Snow White and Pinocchio. So he hoped that if the songs can become commercial hits, then that can help make the movie become commercial hits too. So for the first time, Disney hired songwriters and composers outside of the studio by contacting the New York City music group Tin Pen Alley and brought on board Al Hoffman, Mac David, and Jerry Livingston. The reason why Walt picked them was because of their 1947 hit Chibaba Chibaba, which he felt like a song of that style would be perfect for the fairy godmother scene. Chibaba, Chibaba, Chihuahua, Angelawa, Kukula, Goomba. Chibaba, Chibaba, Chihuahua, my bambino go to sleep. David and Livingston also brought with them singer Eileen Woods in order to make the demos of the music. However, as she sang, there was an unmistakable sense of sweetness and beauty onto her voice. So after hearing the demos, Walt contacted Eileen to become the voice of Cinderella. But getting outside help for the songs is not the only musical first for Disney with this feature. It was also the first time that the score was composed after the animation was finished, and the first to use overdubbing vocals where Cinderella sings in harmony with herself in the song Sing Sweet Nightingale. Oh, sing sweet nightingale, sing. The two-year production was obviously different from before now that the animation team had become less dependent on Walt's input, but they know that everything was on the line to ensure the movie's success, especially when this had a nearly $3 million budget. In fact, that same tension from the days of Snow White returned when they knew that if this failed, then the studio and Disney's legacy would be entirely over. And so, when it premiered on February 15th, 1950, and later released on March 4th, Walt wished for another Snow White, and he got another Snow White. The film received great praise from critics, stating that the classic fairy tale charm of Disney is back. And the best part? It was also a tremendous success at the box office by earning $8 million, which years later, after all the re releases, the total ultimately became $315 million. Walt also got his wish of the songs to become a success as well, as the album reached number one on the Billboard pop charts. Oh, and there is one more first for the music here I almost forgot. This is the first time that Disney licensed and published the soundtrack under their own label, the Walt Disney Music Company. So the revenue earned from those albums also go directly to Disney and making Cinderella's success more significant for the company. The movie later received a good amount of nominations and awards, including three Oscar nominations for Best Sound, Best Music, and Best Original Song for Bippity Boppity Boo, and received the Golden Bear for Music Film along with the Big Bronze Plate at the first Berlin International Film Festival. Decades later, the film ranked at number 9 on AFI's Top 10 Animated Films and was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry in late 2018. 
At the parks, Cinderella got one of the highest honors of having the castle at the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World and later in Tokyo Disneyland be named after her. Cinderella also received two significant directed video sequels, including Cinderella 2 Dreams Come True in 2002, which is often regarded as one of the worst Disney directed video sequels, and Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time in 2007, which is often regarded as one of the best Disney directed video sequels. In 2015, Disney released a live action remake of the film directed by Kenneth Branagh and starring Lily James, Cate Blanchett, and Helena Bonham Carter, which that also became a hit with solid reviews, an Oscar nomination for Best Costume Design, and earned around $542 million at the box office. No matter how hard he was grieving, Walt kept on believing that he can still enchant the world with his magic, and the movie showed that the dream that he wished came true. Thanks to the great success of Cinderella, Disney could finally move forward to grow his company and produce more animated features. This also gave him the opportunity to bring back to life several ideas for movies he wanted to make ever since the 1930s. Need proof of this? Then take a look at the opening of Pinocchio when Jiminy sings When You Wish Upon a Star. If you look at the top left corner, there are two books that teased a couple of upcoming projects that Walt had in store. Now with his newfound Cinderella money, he could finally open those books to tell these classic stories in the way he knows best, starting with the big pink one, Alice in Wonderland. The movie focuses on a little girl named Alice who got highly curious when she saw a white rabbit in a waistcoat panicking that he was late. When following him up to a big rabbit hole, she falls in and finds herself in Wonderland, a world where the strange and unusual is common and those in it must always expect the unexpected. But now that her curiosity puts her in an extraordinary predicament, she discovers how far she'll go to find that white rabbit while encountering many of Wonderland's craziest inhabitants. Throughout his life, Walt Disney always had a fascination with the Lewis Carroll books, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Through the Looking Glass. At the start of his career, his first successful series he made in Hollywood was the Alice Comedies, starring a live-action girl in her episodic adventures in a cartoon world, with the first also being the last laugh cartoon in 1923 called Alice's Wonderland. As early as 1933, Walt had the idea to create an entire feature film based on the books with his first concept to be in a similar format to the Alice comedies, where a live-action Alice, considered to be played by Mary Pickford, who finds herself in an animated Wonderland. However, after he saw that Paramount released their Alice in Wonderland film in that same year, he decided to scrap those plans in favor of making Snow White his first movie. But the idea of an Alice in Wonderland adaptation never left Disney's mind. In fact, he had Mickey star in a loose adaptation in 1936 called Through the Mirror. After Snow White's success, Walt decided to fully move forward with an Alice movie, even by buying the film rights of the famous Sir John Tenniel illustrations. From there, he assigned storyboard artist Al Perkins, along with British art director David Hall, to develop an entire story, along with some concept art for the movie. The result came in a 1939 story reel that Walt did not enjoy. What he saw in that reel were nothing but problems, or at least in terms of making his version of the story. While Hall's illustrations were well done, they resembled too much like the drawings of Tenniel's, and that would be way too complicated to animate. And while the script written by Perkins stayed true to the books, it was way too dark and even too grotesque by Disney standards. Fixing this up would require a lot of work. However, as time moved on and the 1940s was giving the company a hard time with the financial flops and World War II, Walt had no choice but to let go of the project. After the war, he slowly brought it back, but again, getting the right story was proven to be difficult. Some versions tried and failed to make something he would approve of. Even when British author Aldous Huxley took a shot, his take was said to be too literal. The search for his wonderland was proven to be an unsuccessful mission. But then everything changed when he noticed the unique artwork of one of his artists. 
Enter Mary Blair, who began working for Disney in 1940 for films like Fantasia and Dumbo. A year later, she joined Walt and his team to go on the South America Goodwill Tour, and out of all the people who attended, including Walt himself, that trip affected her life the most, and it forever changed her art style. After the tour, her art became more colorful, modern, and a lot more stylized than before. Obviously, this caught the eye of Disney, and he decided to make her art more prominent in his animated films afterwards like Saludos Amigos and The Three Caballeros, and be the concept artist for other features like Cinderella and Peter Pan. Later on, her art style would become the signature look for one of Disney's most iconic attractions, It's a Small World, and created many murals for the parks, including this massive mosaic at the Contemporary Resort in Walt Disney World. Anyways, back onto Alice, Walt found some of the concept art done by Blair, and he realized how he can truly tell his version of the story. It doesn't have to go by the book or share the same illustrations, it can be a lot more colorful, whimsical, and even a bit more comical. And so, Walt decided to move forward with this new direction and have it be an all-animated Alice movie. As it combines elements from both books, there were plenty of characters that had to be cut out for the movie for the sake of pacing. However, some were close to consideration while in development. There was the whole scene in the Duchess's Manor, an encounter with a very goofy-looking Jabberwock that was replaced by the Walrus and the Carpenter, the White Knight that was replaced with Alice singing Very Good Advice despite Walt enjoying the scene, and the Mock Turtle and the Griffin. However, the latter duo would later appear in a Jell-O commercial with Alice. Of course I had some schooling, but the extras I just simply couldn't afford. He couldn't afford the cooking course and he's dying to learn how to cook. Otherwise, how can I entertain? Oh, well, I'll teach you how to make jello. How to cook jello? Mm, you don't have to. Just quick as a wink, you have a beautiful dessert. And inexpensive, too. Can I entertain with jello? Mm, there's nothing quite like jello for entertaining. Everybody loves its jolly smile. So when's the jello party? Tomorrow. We, we accept. accept. Yes, when it comes to entertaining, there's nothing quite like jello. As usual, live-action references were made to help out the animators, but there was one moment that stood out from the rest that ended up in the final film in the most unexpected way. Since many of the voice actors would also lend their hand in the references as their respective characters, vaudevillian actor Ed Wynn was brought on board to play as the Mad Hatter, and he unleashed a performance that had everyone laughing. When Wynn returned to properly record his lines in front of the mic, they all realized that they could never recapture that magic and that comedy from the filming. So for the final cut, they decided to use the audio directly from the live action reference. Butter! Butter, oh thank you, butter. Yes, that's fine. Tea, oh I never thought of tea, of course. Tea. <laughs> Sugar, two spoons, just to, two spoons, thank you, yes. Mustard? Mustard, yes, but... Mustard! Don't let's be silly! Lemon, that's different. Uh. Out of all the films made by Disney, Alice in Wonderland holds the record for having the most songs in one movie with 14 of them, even if some only last for about a few seconds. When it was time to promote the film while it was close to finishing, Disney began to have a keen interest in the new entertainment medium called television. Wald and Roy agreed that they could use it as a marketing device to highly present any of their big upcoming projects. And so, on Christmas Day 1950, Disney released his first television special called One Hour in Wonderland, which was sponsored by the Coca-Cola Company and aired on NBC. It presented many cartoons and a sneak peek of the movie, and it featured Walt with Catherine Beaumont, the voice of Alice, along with several other actors who previously worked with Disney as special guests. However, that wouldn't be the movie's only piece of promotion on television. The company also created a 10-minute documentary on the making of the film called Operation Wonderland, and had a special segment dedicated to the picture in The Fred Waring Show. After its premiere on July 26, 1951, it was... Yeah, there's no going around this. It sucked. 
While the critics didn't necessarily pan the movie, they did state that the quality was more in line with Disney's cartoons more than their movies. But when it came to the fans of the books and British critics, they despised the feature and claimed Disney destroyed a classic piece of literature by completely Americanizing it. Even Walt himself wasn't a fan of the film either, stating that it failed because it lacked heart. It didn't help either that it was a box office flop too, as the film only made $2.4 million domestically and lost the company a million dollars. Everything about the film's release was a mess. Disney even went into a lawsuit against another film adaptation of Alice, the 1949 French film by Dallas Bauer, because it was going to be released in America around the same time as theirs. However, once the madness of its initial run subsided, the movie found the time to display its true colors to the world. Despite the criticisms, it did receive an Oscar nomination for Best Scoring of a Musical Picture, and the characters became prominently featured at the parks. In fact, two classic attractions were based on the movie, including a dark ride at Disneyland and the Mad Tea Party, a spinning teacup ride that became a staple in almost every Disney park. Unlike some of the other early Disney features, Alice in Wonderland almost never got a re-release. Instead, the movie would often be aired on television and slowly gathered an audience from there. But very similar to Fantasia, it wasn't until the late 1960s and early 1970s where Alice received newfound fame in the psychedelic age, where people were totally digging on the trippiness. So much so that Disney took notice and finally gave the film its first re-release in 1974, capitalizing on its psychedelic nature. This time, not only did the marketing work and the film became more successful, but both audiences and critics were starting to really warm up to the movie and has since appreciated as a Disney classic. Later on, in 2010, Disney released a loosely inspired live-action adaptation of the books and the 1951 movie directed by Tim Burton. Although critically mixed, it was a smash hit getting over a billion dollars at the box office and winning two Oscars for Best Art Direction and Best Costume Design. It also released a sequel in 2016 called Alice Through the Looking Glass, but that film ended up becoming a failure in every way. After falling down that rabbit hole, Disney's Alice went through quite a journey from being completely shunned to becoming one of the most well-known and most beloved adaptations of the story. Nowadays, it would seem mad to think that there was a time when this was hated. But then again, most everyone's mad here. I Back to that opening scene from Pinocchio, there was another book that teased an upcoming feature from Disney that was leaning next to the Alice one. It was small, brown, and the title of it was Peter Pan. It's about the darling children, Wendy, John, and Michael, who were visited by a flying boy who never grew up named Peter Pan. After giving them some pixie dust from his fairy comrade Tinkerbell, the kids fly off to Peter Pan's home, Neverland. A place filled with fantasy where they meet up with Peter's crew, the Lost Boys, Natives, and Mermaids, all while avoiding the wrath of Captain Hook and his pirates who want revenge on Pan for having the captain lose his hand to a crocodile. Ever since he was young, Walt Disney was always fascinated by the story of J.M. Barry and grew up watching several interpretations of the tale. When he was a boy, he saw a touring theatrical production of the story, and in 1924, he watched the silent film directed by Herbert Brennan, where the fantasy and swashbuckling adventure immediately captured Walt's imagination. While the studio was making Snow White, Disney considered other ideas for animated features after his first one, and Peter Pan stood out to be the perfect story for animation, as it allowed the team to do much more than anything that the original stage show could ever present. He originally thought at one point to have this be his second animated feature after Snow White, but it wouldn't be until 1939 when Walt got the animation rights to Pan and went straight into production. Once again, he had David Hall to provide concept art for a story reel, which the plot originally had the dog Nana join in the adventure. But similar to Alice in Wonderland, it shared some of the same issues as before including the story being much darker by Disney standards and even compared to the play at some points. 
There was an alternate opening where it starts out in Neverland and then goes to the real world where Peter kidnaps a mother for the Lost Boys. John was left out on going to Neverland for being too practical. Tinkerbell told Captain Hook about the Lost Boys hideout on her own free will. A scene where the characters find the pirate's treasure in a place that's heavily loaded with traps and Tink dying from poison to save Peter. At that point, Walt and his team went back and forth regarding many different plot possibilities for the movie. But once again, everything had to stop by the end of 1941 when World War II came into the scene. After that period, production slowly turned back on with consideration on which actors to play the parts, but it wasn't until 1947 when Walt decided to put his foot down on the company's economic situation and fully resume work on animated features. Like I've mentioned before, Cinderella was the first to be approved, then Alice was next in line, and then Peter Pan got the green light in 1949. When it was time to be serious about casting, Disney decided to not go far to find the key actors. When casting the part of Peter Pan himself for the stage play and in some film productions, it was always a tradition to give that part to a woman, which is still often practiced to this day. However, for Disney's version, Walt gave the part to child actor Bobby Driscoll, who previously appeared in Disney films like Song of the South, So Dear to My Heart, and Treasure Island, making him the first ever boy to play the boy who never grew up. In the case of Wendy, the part was given to Catherine Beaumont straight after her job as the lead in Alice in Wonderland, which explains why Wendy looks like the long-lost sister of Alice. As for Captain Hook, he was played by Hans Conried, who was already at Disney by appearing as the Magic Mirror for their TV programs and specials. Also, in tradition of the original show, he was also the voice of Mr. Darling. For many years, there was an urban legend on the film that they hired Marilyn Monroe to be the live-action reference of Tinkerbell. However, some quick research will prove that this is actually false. Not only her status as a Hollywood icon has yet to happen during the making of the feature, but mainly because the job was actually done by actress Margaret Carey. She was also the model and the voice of the mermaids alongside Connie Hilton and June Foray. During the early 1940s, Disney had their classic songwriters and composers create some songs for the picture like Frank Churchill, Charles Walcott, and Elliot Daniel. However, when the new production took shape in the early 1950s, Almost all the old songs got rejected in favor of new ones by Sammy Kahn and Sammy Fain. The opening song, The Second Star to the Right, was actually recycled from a deleted song from Alice in Wonderland called Beyond the Laughing Sky, where they took the melody of that song and added new lyrics to fit with the Peter Pan narrative. The second star to the right shines in the night for you. When the movie flew into theaters on February 5th, 1953, the film turned out to be good. Not great, but still did a solid performance. The critics felt mixed with the music and how it doesn't take as much risks as the original source material, but they did highly praise the animation. As for the box office, it had a solid run by earning $7 million domestically, which after the re-releases, accumulated to a grand domestic total of $87.4 million. However, while Neverland is a paradise where no one can grow up, there is one element that certainly did not age well. As time moved on, the movie gained some controversy over its stereotypical depiction of the natives, or Indians as they call them here, along with the song What Made the Red Man Red. Yes, there can be arguments regarding on how society viewed racism at the time, and the original J.M. Barry play had this problem as well, so the movie was just staying true to its source material. But even the animators, when they looked back, admitted that this aspect was quickly outdated. But on the bright side, one of the songs would later have a life of its own and become a renowned children's tune. And believe it or not, it's a semi-deleted song. Well, I say semi-deleted because while none of the characters actually sing it, the instrumental does often play. I say, Captain, do you hear something? No. 
Created by Frank Churchill and Jack Lawrence, this was the only pre-World War II song that made it to the final film, or partially at least, and the song found its own popularity when Jerry Lewis released his version in the same year as the movie's release. Never smile at a crocodile, no you can't get friendly with a crocodile. A few years later, alongside Disneyland's opening, there was an attraction based on the movie called Peter Pan's Flight that allowed guests to ride the movie, which has since become a staple in almost every Disney park, and has amazed guests every day on how a simple ride can always gather such huge lines! <laughs> In 2002, Disney released in theaters a sequel to the film by Disney Movie Tunes called Return to Neverland, where Peter Pan has to rescue Wendy's daughter Jane and teach her how to believe. The reviews were not great, but it was a box office hit by making $109 million. In 2011, Disney Junior created a spin-off children's series called Jake and the Neverland Pirates that's about a group of pirate kids always outsmarting Captain Hook and Mr. Smee, which had a strong run for four seasons with a total of 114 episodes. But among everything that came out of this picture, there is one character that ended up becoming a Disney icon as big as Mickey Mouse, and that is Tinkerbell. Ever since the movie's release, she was always there to begin Disney's TV shows and specials with her magic, and initiated some of the fireworks shows at the Disney parks by flying across the castle. Not to mention being a merchandise queen! In 2005, Disney created a new franchise dedicated to Tinkerbell called Disney Fairies, which started out with a series of books, but then expanded into a direct-to-video computer-animated film series with seven features made, starting with 2008's Tinkerbell. While it had a long travel to become the movie we know today, all it needed to become a Disney classic was just faith, trust, and a little bit of pixie dust. As you could tell, there is a bit of a theme here of movies that have been in development since the late 1930s, but never got completed until Disney got the studio back in shape in the early 1950s. But while Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan were all produced around the same time, there is one more movie that fits in this category, but wouldn't be released until much later in 1955. That film was Lady and the Tramp. It's the story of a cocker spaniel named Lady, who lived a very comfortable and pampered life with her owners. But then things take an unexpected turn when a baby enters the scene stealing Lady's attention. After some misunderstandings got Lady in trouble, she gets out and finds help from a street smart mutt named Tramp. And while they may have complete opposite lifestyles, that won't stop the inevitable romance between the two. For Disney fans, they're most likely familiar with the story of Walt Disney giving his wife Lillian a puppy in a hat box as a Christmas present, which was the inspiration for the opening scene of the movie. Some have stated that this was the spark that ignited the idea of Lady and the Tramp. While there could be some truth to Walt's puppy gift, was that the moment that inspired the feature? No! If we're gonna talk about the true origins of the movie, then let's bring in one of Walt's most trusted story artists, Joe Grant. Back in 1937, Joe drew some sketches of his English Springer Spaniel, Lady, whom he admitted was pushed to the side when Joe and his wife had their new baby. When Walt found the drawings, he was highly amused and asked Grant to develop a plot for a movie about this dog. For several years, Joe and many other artists worked timelessly to fully develop this story about a dog's antics around the house, interacting with the other dogs in the neighborhood, and confronting a couple of evil cats owned by a mean mother-in-law and a dangerous rat. But with every version they presented, Walt completely hated every single one, mainly because of the main character Lady. Yeah, she's cute and very pampered, but that's not enough to carry an entire feature film. At that point, the project became hopeless and Disney was ready to scrap it by the time World War II came in. But then it all changed when the solution to his problems came in in the form of a short story in Cosmopolitan. It was called Happy Dan the Cynical Dog by Ward Green, 
which told the tale of a stray mutt who manipulates people in order to get free food. When he read it, Disney realized this was what was missing in Lady. It didn't need more action or scenarios that she had to face, but another dog who's the complete opposite of Lady, but the two end up falling in love. Soon afterwards, Walt bought the film rights to the story and resumed production of the newly named Lady and the... Oh wait, they didn't figure out a name for him yet. Before the team settled on Tramp, there were several names that were experimented to see what would suit best for the new cynical dog, including Rags, Bozo, and even Homer. I want to stay, sit, roll over, and beg. Please, 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 please. By 1949, Grant left the studio to pursue his own artistic business, but the story crew still continued forward to combine elements of both the Ward Green story and Joe's original concept, which they finally settled with a final plot by 1953. Unfortunately, Grant did not receive any credit for the story in the final film, as the opening title only mentioned Green. It wouldn't be until many years later through home media bonus features and books where they properly highlighted Joe's important contribution to the picture. Now, you may have noticed something that's significantly different here than from the previously mentioned features. Every time I show a clip from the movie, they are a lot more widescreen than the usual full-frame aspect ratio from before. That's because this is the first ever animated feature to be presented in CinemaScope, which was invented in 1953 to give theaters an easier way to present widescreen movies by just switching the lens on the projector as a way to fight against television that was threatening the movie theater business. The only downside to CinemaScope was for the animators, since they had to face the obstacle of adjusting to the new screen size that gave them more space for the characters to go around and develop more details to the backgrounds. This resulted in less close-ups, characters to be more spread out to fill the frame, and longer takes. However, Disney was aware that not all theaters had CinemaScope and wouldn't be able to present the movie. So to go around this, the studio made two different versions of the feature one in full screen, and the other in CinemaScope widescreen, resulting in the artist to adjust some scenes in order to accommodate the full smaller screen ratio. Originally, Mary Blair was supposed to work on the backgrounds of the feature, since she did create some concept art earlier in production. However, since she left in 1953 to work on illustrations for children's books, the position of the film was mainly taken by Ivan Earl. In order to achieve Lady's perspective of inside her home, another background artist, Claude Coates, created 3D models of the interior and took low-angle pictures in order to deliver live-action references of the house in a dog's point of view. Speaking of the environment, the small town that the movie is set in was inspired by Walt's fondly remembered childhood home, Marceline, Missouri, but more in his nostalgic perspective since the area is depicted as a colorful and almost dreamlike turn-of-the-century American town. As the studio had great experience in the past with this on Bambi, animal studies, specifically on dogs, were heavily utilized in order to capture the movements and mannerisms of canines. There was one sequence meant to establish the romance that was actually close to getting removed from the feature because Wolf thought that it would seem a bit ridiculous and hard to imagine how audiences would take it seriously. However, animator Frank Thomas was determined to prove his boss wrong, so much so that he went and fully animated the scene himself. What was I thinking? When test screened to Disney, he ended up being impressed and ultimately decided to keep it in the picture. That part ended up becoming the most famous scene of the movie when Lady and Tramp were eating spaghetti and their love fully bloomed from there. For the music, it was the last time that Oliver Wallace composed the score for a Disney animated feature, which the torch would later be passed on to George Bruns. On the other hand, as Walt still wanted the musical numbers of his pictures to be pop hits, he brought on board Peggy Lee along with Sonny Burke to write the songs. As a music superstar, she was also hired to help promote the feature on television and to be the voice of several characters, including one of Lady's owners, Darling, Cy and Am, and the dog named after her, Peg. You won't believe this, dearie, but no matter how tight a jam he's in, that tramp always finds some way out. When it was released on June 22, 1955, the film turned out to be a great success. 
not only from the promotional help on television, but also with Ward Green who chipped in by writing a novel of the film two years prior to make audiences familiar with the story. As for the box office, it managed to earn $6.5 million, and as its popularity continuously grew with every re-release, the movie ended up earning a grand total of $187 million. As for how it performed with critics, they actually did not like this one. In fact, to quote Time, they stated that Walt Disney has for so long parlayed gooey sentiments and stark horror into profitable cartoons that most moviegoers are apt to be more surprised than disappointed to discover that the combination somehow does not work this time. However, this resentment did not last long. As Time moved on, not only did it gather a large following, but even critics were starting to give it more credit than before. So much so that the AFI placed it at number 95 of their list of the top 100 greatest love stories of all time. But with this newfound praise, there was also a little bit of backlash over certain elements. The Siamese Cat song gained more distaste from the public for its stereotypical depiction of Asian culture, and decades after the film's release, Disney got into some legal trouble with Peggy Lee, when on November of 1988, Lee sued the company for breach of contract. Since she was a key player in creating the film, mostly on the music, she also had the rights to transcriptions to the music, meaning that she owned the songs and would get a cut of the revenue on anything that had them. But when Disney turned the movie into the best-selling VHS of its time in 1987, she called them out for not getting her share. After a few years in 1991, she won the legal battle and was awarded $2.3 million. Back onto the movie, the film received a direct-to-video sequel in 2001 called Lady and the Tramp 2 Scamp's Adventure and a live-action remake in 2019 starring Tessa Thompson and Justin Theroux voicing Lady and Tramp respectively that was released with the launch of Disney streaming service Disney+. Plus. It took some time for Disney to find Lady her match, and at first, the connection wasn't strong. But it took some time for the crew and critics to warm up to the picture and find the charm that's inside. And now it is highly beloved as a Disney masterpiece and often proclaimed to be one of the most iconic romance films in cinema history. <laughs> Samson?